My name is Joshua Gibson, and you are listening to the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, a show dedicated to promoting a message of critical thinking as it pertains to strength training, nutrition, and well-being. This is done through interviews with experts, high-level athletes, coaches, and people heavily involved in strength sports and athletic development. Pull up a chair, grab a coffee, and let's get on to today's podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. My name is Joshua Gibson. I'm your host and I'm joined today by the one and only Chris Tabor. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. uh, We are renovating the West Virginia Weightlifting uh, club space. So we are embedded in CrossFit Ridgeline. We have... Uh, eight platforms, a handful of racks, tons of bars, tons of plates, tons of equipment. And the club's been developed over time by by Dr. Hornsby, uh, Dr. Guy Horns- Hornsby. And uh, we, got, we kind of got to this point where I think he was mentioning like the floor and we kind of had this like spark of, you know, maybe we should kind of renovate things. And I kind of pursued it and pushed it. And then we got the approval from the gym owner. And and now we're in, we're like neck deep in the renovation process. So we've got everything taken out from that space, busting up concrete. We got that moved. We have like a few holes to fill with actual concrete itself, get the floor level, get it reinforced, um, painting walls, redoing all the platforms, sanding, cutting, edging, like doing as much as humanly possible. And it's chaotic. It's great. Uh, so I was there for a few hours before the podcast. Um, now I'm here now, I'm, now I'm joined with you. How, how's your day going? Everything's going great. We're transitioning more into summertime with the semester being uh, on the downswing. And that means more time for outside projects and writing and research and all the fun stuff. No, and that's, that's actually a great segue into what we wanted to talk about today, which is exercise sequencing and i think more broadly that'd be captured by this concept of periodization and and i I know the listeners are like oh periodization i know what that is uh but i wanted to capture a little bit more of a nuanced aspect of it um which is just exercise sequencing and, and variation and um how to build a program. And what I mean by that is like how to create like this framework by which each block really does emphasize and enhance the effectiveness and the quality of the training in each subsequent block. Um, And and I started working with a a guy who I kind of programmed for shortly in the past. Uh, He took some time off, had a bunch of yeah, they had to get surgery, (laughs) maybe a couple of times. He'll he'll correct me because he'll listen to this. Um, he got back into training, was writing his own program, making good progress, and, and felt like he needed someone else to kind of guide the ship for him. And you know, it's it's super collaborative process. It's it's a back and forth, and it's him giving me great info about what works, the structure, all these things, and it's me taking that and saying, "What would I do?" and, and kind of overlaying that on top. And I uh, I was kind of in the process the last few days of of thinking about it, and then actually putting pen to paper building out 15 weeks, which is the lead up to American Open Series 2. So he'll travel down from Edmonton to compete at AO2, uh, which I think, is, which is in Texas. Um, so if anyone's going to be there, I'd love to catch up. Um, so just reach out and let me know. And um, kind of build, building out this program for Jordan and just thinking about the importance of exercise sequencing and the, the, the ability to create a program that just develops over time. And Early on, you, you, I'm sure plenty of, of people are familiar with this. You'll build a block of training. It'll be great. And then the next one just really fizzles or tanks. You're like, well, what happened? I mean, it's not like it's not like the training itself is – I don't know. I don't know. How to, it's, it's not like there was poor, poor sequencing. It's just like you couldn't tie things together well. Um, so maybe the, the training itself individually could be good, but then when you stack them together, it just, it's not as congruent as it could be. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts kind of generally about this, like this idea of 
sequencing training effectively. And you can take this wherever you want. I, I, I'm I'm kind of agnostic to where it goes. I'd love to talk about exercise variation and how to tie things together well, but kind of what's your experience and thoughts around sequencing training effectively? Yeah. So if you think of the timelines, uh, the first thing when it comes to periodization is you go from the least specific to the most specific, which most people know. And that means that you have probably a wider variety of exercises early on. They may not look much like competition. They could be building up more general qualities. And then as you approach competition, they become more and more specific to the point where they should look almost like competition in the weeks leading up. So pretty standard in a periodization model. But the other factor is what we like to think of as uh, the sequential planning so that one block builds into the next and that it's an additive effect. So what you do in this block potentiates the next block through phase potentiation. And that's often thought of through the sequencing of the main quality that you're targeting, but you also need to consider it with the exercises mm. that you're going to use within that sequence. So, you know, you might have more of a volume block to build up the lifter's capacity to handle work. And then you may go into some strength type blocks and then power, and then you do a tapering and peaking. So that follows a logical and phasic progression, but we should also pick the exercises that sequence together so that they build off of each other alongside those other qualities that we're developing. And so that's where I think the idea of variation comes in, but also stacking exercises that build so that in the end they've developed on top of each other and you don't get that kind of dip in the program because if you use everything in the first block, you may have nowhere to go in the second block. Yeah. Mission of Weightlifting House is to bring the sport of weightlifting closer to the coaches, fans, and athletes. They're able to do this by supporting the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. You can use the code PHILWL, that's P-H-I-L-W-L, at the USA Weightlifting House store. That will save you 10% off all products, including bars, straps, wraps, singlets, and anything else you could imagine. That is Phil WL, P-H-I-L-W-L, to save 10% off everything at the Weightlifting House store. And by supporting the podcast, you support Weightlifting House. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's a really important point. And that's kind of, honestly, that's how I, you kind of, like I'll lay out, I'll look at weeks, or I'll look, I'll look at like the competition and then I'll look at the training blocks and then I'll look at the emphasis of the training week, and and really it's it's very you know specific uh, in that it's like the competition is the competition. It's AO two. It's the end of August, beginning of September. That's from today, like sixteen weeks or fifteen weeks. Um, that means we're going to have three to four blocks, maybe f I mean five, depending on how you break it up. And then those are going to have the different. Um, emphases that you mentioned so it might be a general prep or a specific special prep or a, a competition prep and even within those those could be uh, bifurcated slightly so that like a specific prep could be what i would call like a an extensive specific prep where maybe we're still focusing a little bit more on volume or having larger volumes of training or you could have more of an intensive specific prep and then that would be built into weeks that would structure the application of the stressors that are volume. And then when I say load, I kind of mean percent of one RM intensity. Um, so we could have, you know, more of a kind of a building week from a volume standpoint where we're looking at adding sets, we're looking at adding reps, we're looking at changing like total work done. And then we can have more of a, a load or intensity focused week where we're kind of like, maybe we're paring down on, on volume and, and increasing intensity. And then we could have like down weeks where it's a intentional period of a reduction in stress to allow for fatigue to come off. And then we have a week following, which would be the highest intensity or load week. Um, and where we would push into, you know, the highest or heaviest weights that we've touched. So like, that's kind of how you would structure. That's how I generally structure from the top down. It's like competition, two blocks, two weeks, two then exercises that fill in the sessions within the weeks. And when I look at it, it, a lot of it really is what are the most general exercises that we're going to do 
that sequence well into the basic structure of training that we want and the different like um uh different foci that we also have which would be and and this is i'm going to use a couple of examples to explain this point like remember max kind of talking about exercise selection and he was thinking of it from like a phase of the lift standpoint which is what's the technical error we're really focused on targeting if it's the transition we're going to look at a a a, a plethora of exercises that target the transition and we you know, we kind of rank them subconsciously on uh, specificity so we would have you know low hang low block um it's like a yo-yo or pump snatch and you have all these like pauses below the knee and you'd have all these exercises that then have like they're like amended again to make maybe a little less specific, but still to target the phase of the lift. So you'd say, what are the phases of the lift we're most concerned by? What are the muscles we're most concerned by building or like the, the strength profile? So like, you know, isometric strength in the low back or these positions or whatever. Taking that, grabbing a handful of exercises, saying we're going to dump these in. They're going to be the most general versions, but pretty much the most targeted to the technical error or the quality we're looking at developing. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just recently wrote a block for someone who's kind of coming off of a little, a little like back tweak and we, we had to modify training quite a bit, but I made all of the exercises as constrained as possible. It's no hook, no feet, no contact from the high blocks. And we're going to work down. And she was one kilo from her all time best and like felt great. Didn't pull heavy, didn't squat heavy, didn't do really many heavy, many heavy lifts, but the technical constraints were so effective that like her technique looked awesome when she was warming up. I was like, man, I haven't seen you lift like this in a long time. Um, so you're going to take those really constrained, really general, really targeted exercises early on. And then you're going to look at how does that profile into the, what it, it's a competitive block, which I used to kind of, I think create like the straw man idea of what a competition block is where it's like, Oh, we're all Bulgarian, you know, it's Bulgarian. Tra- it's like, realistically, it's not what it is. It's just like the highest loads, the, the most touches for the classic lifts. Even then you could have variations that emphasize the technical point you were trying to develop earlier on kind of as like maintenance loads or exercises that just reinforce different things like confidence or kind of speed under the bar or whatever it is. Um, but you're seeing that shift and it's important not to bottleneck yourself early on by saying, we're going to do low block snatches and then we're going to go to the floor and then it's like, oh, you still have two more blocks and suddenly all of your lips are from the floor because that's just the way they've sequenced. And like you can do that and then you can play around with rep and set scheme and load and say, well, we're then we'll go from maybe we'll do triples and quads or we'll do doubles and triples and come to singles or we'll switch to on the minute work. So you can play around with it. I think it just takes a lot of like jerry rigging, so to speak, if you – bottleneck yourself with the exercise you select earlier on in a program and that's why i think that like big picture plan is very important because i've bottlenecked myself plenty of times where i'll like write things out and i won't kind of finish the thought so to speak with a program and then i'll be like oh shit i don't know where to go so suddenly you're like patching versus building um i don't know how long it took you to kind of feel like you've got a grip on that but What's I, I described, I think, broadly in my process. What's your process for creating a program and creating the structure by which general feeds into competitive and you're going from you know general developmental to expressing that on the platform? Yeah, it's a great question. So first thing I do when we're sitting down to create a longer-term block is I look at what is the bottleneck in performance. So I will look at the technical execution, and then I will look at the athlete as a whole and determine what is the factor that's holding them back. Is their technique uh, deteriorating in a certain way that they need more technical work in a certain area? Or is it maybe that they have a strength deficit or an imbalance in their strength that might be affecting their technique? And this is important to know Because if your strength is the bottleneck, you are going to sequence your exercises different to emphasize that strength development compared to if it's a technical uh, breakdown. And so I have some athletes who are strong in relation to their lifts, but they can't translate that strength into the barbell. Their program is going to look different 
than someone whose technique is relatively stable, but they're really lacking in uh, the strength in a specific movement. And we're going to have to put more emphasis into that. And based on how that bottleneck bottleneck is presented is going to lead to what's going to change in that first block. They'll have more similarities again, because we're following that overall pattern of more volume, more exercises, but then there may be a secondary emphasis on specific muscle group strengthening, or if their body weight's not in a correct area. So those are how I approach the beginning plan so that we can get to the end in a more effective manner. Yeah. Do you think there, and I know, I, I feel like I've just lost the pulse of where a general understanding of training theory is like, like gen, general weightlifting, general weightlifting coaches, general powerlifting coaches. Like I've lost such a, a sense of the, that, that pulse, um, that I'm like, Oh, everybody knows everything. Everyone's super smart. And we're just all going to talk about it. Uh, where do you think people land on this idea of periodization being effective? It, Cause I still kind of hear like, Oh, we do, we do periodization. And it's like, I don't, like, I know what that means, but I don't know what that means. Cause it's just like, so just like, you know, it's like when you, instead of saying like, Oh yeah, I like, I like to drink soda and kind of whatever. It's like, I, I, I like, you know, I do Coke. It's like that. It's one way to say it. I don't, I don't know if it's like an exactly accurate representation. So when people do periodization and you get that retort of, well, periodization is not supported in the literature where does the literature stand on this idea of periodization and where does that fall flat in regards to, I think what we're all, what we're talking about currently, I think it's a great conversation. I think it's true. I think it's at least in my understanding, the best way to approach planning and programming. Um, where does the body of literature stand on either supporting or not this stuff? Hey, what's up weightlifters? Danny here, founder of Onyx Weightlifting Co., a leather accessories company specializing in weightlifting gear. In our shop, we make gear that doesn't get in the way of your performance because we understand that hitting lifts requires your full attention. Our straps, wrist wraps, and belts are designed to be comfortable and reliable, so all you need to do is make lifts. Thanks for listening to our friend Josh's podcast. You can continue to support him by visiting our online shop at onyxstraps.com and using his code PhilWL. That's P-H-I-L-W-L at checkout. C1 so for platform. some aspects of performance, it's not well supported in the literature. So if you look at something like hypertrophy, especially in the studies that we currently have, th- there appears to be no additional benefit mm. to doing a periodized plan for like, let's say maximal muscular hypertrophy. Let's say you're a bodybuilder. But if you look at some of the other studies that look at things like strength development, uh, power development, there are more studies in favor of periodization supporting those outcomes compared to a non-periodized plan. And so, you know, the effects are not huge, but, you know, these studies are hard to conduct and there are not many really long-term periodization studies. Like we're talking like years down the line. Right. But if you think that over this time period, there's a little bit more favorable outcome for a periodized plan than non-periodized. And then you stack those years together. We could, you know, allude to that maybe it's more effective than a non-periodized plan, but the evidence is not overwhelmingly convincing. But if you think about the, the breakdown of training, it seems like it's the best way to go. I think some people don't, look with a long enough lens Hmm. uh, for some of the athletes that they work with. So when they consider periodization, they might consider just the block or, you know, area leading up to the next meet. Whereas Hmm. what you really need to do is when your athletes are at the the competitive level where they're going to be a national level or higher, you definitely have to sequence your training by looking at the whole year or the years leading up to, let's say, the Olympics, that would be like the highest order one that you could look at. And when your athlete is at the national level, your year is going to look different. Uh, Mm -hmm. Your first off season, which is, you know, coming off of your previous year's nationals, that's going to look different. And then your next preparation block happening after the American Open finals. Gotcha. They're not going to look the same because the, the outcomes are different. 
Yes, you're peaking for both meets, but the Nationals is the more important meet compared to the American Open final. And you're not the same athlete after the American Open final as you are after Nationals. There are definitely different uh, times of the year. And so that's where periodization becomes more important in the long run, because for those athletes, you're essentially doing a, a dual peak year for those two big meets. And then obviously if you're even at the next qualification level up, let's say you're going to the Pan American games, you may have three peak or four peak uh, annual plans, depending on the athletes. And then as we've seen with specifically this year, leading up to the Olympics, how do you plan for people that need to peak, you know, eight to 10 times, all the athletes were talking about how hard this quad was because of how many times they had to compete that's when planning becomes increasingly important when you're trying to score all those points. And so when people say periodization doesn't matter, well, it depends on the scale that you're looking at it. And as you become more qualified, periodization becomes more important because the amount of stress that goes on these athletes needs to be carefully managed the better they become. There are a lot of really... In, like important things you, you mentioned and, and things that really like caught my attention. I, I think the first one definitely was this idea of like, a, uh, whatever you want to call it, like an active rest or you know, uh, general prep or, or whatever, like transition, the, the block immediately after competition will look different depending on the competition. I think that's an important point. And, and one that like, that's a good, it's a good reminder for me. I like hearing that. And and it's this idea of one can be even farther from, you know, most specific, right. Can be even more developmental. Um, And then that's going to lead into that prep or the, the period of most specific part of the prep differently than the, the following competition where things are a little more specific volumes might be higher intensities might be up a bit more. So we're seeing differences from, from, you know, time between competitions. Um, and then you're also seeing differences as kind of athletes age or, or develop. Uh, so their training age develops. And, and this is something I actually talked to Danny about this because, uh, we, she missed, uh, she missed a big squat and, and we were kind of thinking about, I was kind of thinking about it and I like to talk through kind of what my thoughts are. And a lot of that's, you know, we made a lot of change, a lot of changes, there are a lot of things that have happened. So, you know, there's, you know, year one and there's year four, and you could be in entirely different places for a, a host of different reasons, moving weight classes, altering technique, um, all the things that happen with accumulated training, uh, just different niggles, different like preferences, different life constraints. Suddenly we're training on different days. We're training a different number of days per week. Like all these things add up and they're they're, They are additive. Um, and then you're looking at like a completely, you know, I say completely different athlete. Obviously you have the same base. I mean, you have mostly the same physiology. Um, but it's, it's like different enough to warrant alterations to a, to a plan and a program. Um, so I think those two things were really what stood out. Um, and, and kind of thinking about this again, a lot of this is it, it, it is somewhat an N equals one where it's what's what's my best guess of what will work and then let's experiment, see what happens. And then on the next prep say, uh, that didn't really turn out how I thought it would or hey, this thing that did work, we tried it again, it didn't work. And, and again, we're working with slightly different athletes at this point. So they're going to have different needs. So a lot of this is like a, a true N equals one in that it's like the only time point that can perfectly represent that time point. And then it's also what's getting us closer and closer to what's needed um, and most effective from a structure, um, a formulation, and a dosing standpoint to then kind of get closer to, hey, this is generally what their program's could look like or should look like heading forward to kind of get the progress that we need. And, and I think, I think that, that point's really well captured. And when you talk to Hampton Morris and Olivia Reeves, um, 
all the other athletes kind of spoken with extens- extensively on the podcast and they talk about, I mean, Kendrick Ferris, right? Like, and they talk about their program and you're like, oh, that's interesting. I don't know if I would ever do that. And it's like, but that's what they do. And that's what they do a lot of the time, if not all the time. And it subtly changes. Um, or they're like big changes, but that's also the style of training they do. So like big fluctuation in volume, big fluctuation in intensity, uh, you know, more more pointed and more um, uh, more like accurate exercise selection to target the problem areas of the technique. So a lot of this also takes the coach kind of saying, what are the general processes or frameworks that we're dealing with? Um, and, and I don't want to say it's patchworking it, but it's like piecing it together in the most effective way. Um, because you mentioned it, I guess, I guess with, you know, saying that this concept of periodization for hypertrophy is not super well supported. It's like, but I'm sure as people become much, much larger humans, that idea of like properly sequencing training to enhance outcomes, but also that big idea of like manage fatigue and to keep training and to train effectively and in a way that's like mostly enjoyable is also important too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I go back to this concept. I'm pretty sure it was, uh, you know, Heraclitus said a really long time ago that no one steps into the same river twice. Mm. And as an athlete progresses, as they get stronger, they're not the same athlete they were before. And every time you reach a new performance baseline, the other factors in a program are going to change alongside them. And so if you start doing multiple PRs in, let's say, squatting, snatch and clean and jerk, as to be expected as time goes on, the percents of your new values are going to change alongside them. And there has to be a period of stabilization Mm -hmm. with your athlete. And that's what some people miss is that the plans may not work the same way because there is a new level of stress that that athlete is encountering as their strength grows. And as that goes up, the amount of fatigue that's coming alongside the increase in their weights has to be tolerated by the body. And so there has to be a period of time where you acclimate to the new weights. And sometimes you have an athlete that hits a really big number and maybe it was unexpected, but instead of jumping right to that number for the next block, maybe you cut it in half to see how they handle it. Mm. You know, you, you, maybe you hit a five kilo uh, clean and jerk PR because it was a fantastic block. Well, if you take your next numbers for your next block off that five kilo increase, your volume load and total amount of stress could jump up considerably. So maybe you cut it in half or you maybe go up by three kilos instead of five and see how they handle it instead of taking all five, because it could just be exhausted at the end because they had a great day, they had a really big lift, but their system might not be ready to handle mm-hmm. that next performance jump. Now that doesn't mean in two or three blocks, you can't use that total number, but you may not want to at that time. And so you need to remember that as you progress, the total amount of weights that you lift and the volumes that you're encountering are going to increase with their strength and numbers increasing. Yeah. I think that's an important point to reiterate. And I think a lot of this comes with, a lot of this comes with experience. And what I mean by that is just like being engaged in a process long enough to see multiple things play out and to say, yeah, it's not (laughs) the worst thing in the world. I mean, it could be, beneficial. I mean, it, it could be beneficial to say, Hey, let's pull back a little bit. And I think some of that comes with experience, just that idea of like a longer term vision of the training process and saying, we don't need to be there right now. We need to be where we want to be, which is 3% higher or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and from a training standpoint, it's like, it's also knowing when to push and pull a little bit. It's like, well, I'll push a little bit on this day and I know I'm going to pull back next week. And and that's like uh, like a micro and a macro level of that of saying like we can push and then we can pull back and then we can put in and seeing it as this like vacillating process that over time trends in a direction or trends to a certain style of training. Uh, but, but it doesn't rush you there. And I've, I've been 
guilty of this of hey let's we're starting a new training you know block of of after a competition it's general i'm thinking we're going to do a lot of volume with a bunch of different new exercises and it's like far too much and you, know, you get a little tweak here and a little tweak there and you're like okay we got to back off and and then it's this process of playing catch up so i think that like somewhat slightly more conservative approach of let's just kind of play the long game isn't it's not that's not periodization like the long game isn't periodization but i think what's baked in is this idea of it's a developmental process where there's an emphasis and de-emphasis and that can be far ranging and this is my own like addendum to that it can be far ranging and it can be with yeah like i i know you're really really strong right now but let's like play it a little bit more conservative just so we can make it the 15 weeks what what can be a little more difficult to, again is like midway in the process derailing and then trying to get yourself back on um and it's like what's the best strategy for for patching a hole in the boat and it's like especially if the hole is like submerged um that's probably a little bit more difficult than like oh well we'll just change speeds avoid whatever objects are kind of in front of us and then play that long game of, of going around rather than trying to go through, but having consistent forward headed, um, a forward headed direction the entire time. So that, that's kind of like just my general spiel on this process of like being like process driven, um, and, and then having some system by which that process can, uh, express itself. What do you think people generally, I don't want to say screw up, but, but have a, have trouble with from like a exercise or block sequencing standpoint, where do people generally slip up? Express the passion that defines you at virus. We understand that when it comes to performance, the slightest edge can mean the difference between winning and losing. Each product is designed and tested with performance in mind. This principle inspired the technology that is infused into our apparel. Built with the intention to move with you and work for you, we create tools meant to help express the passion that defines you. The future of technology-driven apparel. Improve performance, prevent fatigue, recover faster, and go further. Virus is a proud sponsor of Josh Gibson and the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. Use code PHILWL for 10% off at checkout. That's Phil W L P H I L W L for ten percent off. I think sometimes you can't target everything that you need to target at once, and sometimes there may be multiple errors that are occurring, but you need to fix the most important error first. So you know you might be losing the lift in the upper portion, you know, as you're passing the knee and getting to the hip, but it's actually being affected by the positions off the floor in the first pull. And so you, some people may go and try and attack those upper positions first, but the actual bottleneck is below. And so by doing a technical analysis, you can look at what's the primary issue and then say, all right, we have these three things we need to develop, but it needs to go primary emphasis one. So maybe we spend time on that. And then we have a secondary emphasis on these next two, where we maybe have a retaining type technical execution. And then as we fix the primary error, then we can begin to address error two and error three down the line. And so you may throw a bunch of effort to the issue that you're seeing that is actually later in the sequence, mm. you may fix that position. But if your initial position was the main error, that might become magnified later when the weights are heavy. And so it's important to know in the sequence that you may need to become stronger in one position first in order for your later positions to be better, just as an example of something that could occur. And that might be a combo of building the correct muscle in that area, uh, training the nervous system to find those good positions, and then building from there, building in the next blocks from those positions. 
and then trying to hold your technique into the heavier weights because yep. we've all had people it looks great in the early blocks and then you get upwards of 80 85 percent and then they revert right back to their old technique because they just haven't held on to the technique yet with the heavier weights i uh it's funny you mentioned that i was in the weight room yesterday with a football team uh and uh i was talking to the coach coach snyder as kind of i was mentioning to him it was like you know one thing that i kind of struggle with is if i'm coaching if i'm coaching the kids like aggressively and in the sense of it's detail oriented it's on top of hey that's not right that's not right that's not right things will look good things will look great everything's smooth movements movement quality is high I was doing some jump testing yesterday at the start of the session. So I had them kind of warm up and get into the workout and I'm, I'm getting kids. So kids are jumping, you know, getting kids in, they jump next kid in. I'm looking around the room and I'm like, okay, I see some, I see a lot of deviation from what I normally teach or expect. And just without that cueing or that like reminder, I see that reversion back to, like what I would call like suboptimal. Um, So there's like this conscious aspect of being detail oriented, being uh, aware of what the emphasis and and focus is of the movement. So it's like full range of motion, um, target the working joints solely, and then like big emphasis on squeeze and stretch, you know, or, or for squatting, it's like balance, depth, bar path, whatever. Those are just examples, but it's like that reversion away from it. If there's not that, that auditory cue, um, with, you know, athletes, it's like, how do we get that through movements? So teaching them through movements and, and like strengthening those positions. And then it's almost like seeing how your, your, um, how your subconscious, like, uh, drilling and training and reinforcement pans out under load knowing that you know with people who are competitive weightlifters and powerlifters they're gonna they're going to be detail oriented they're going to have technique in mind they're going to integrate cues they're going to be they're going to be conscious and aware of what they are doing what they want to do and then it's almost like how resilient have i made their technique so that when we expose them to higher weights we see it hold up Um, and those, you know, that's a great feeling, right? When you have someone who you've been doing a ton of technical work, I actually said at the start of this podcast, Emily kind of backed off of training. We did a ton of highly, highly technical work. We went to a competition. She snatched one kilo from her best and freaking smoked it. And it's like, okay, so a lot of that drilling, a lot of that extreme variation and emphasizing the quality she struggle with struggles with that was retained that was held on to really really well even under load with the clean and jerk it was but there was like that that just like familiarity with heavy weights that she didn't quite have so with the snatch it was she could have snatched a pr crushed it with a clean and jerk it's like i wish we would have had a few more heavy clean and jerks a few more exposures almost just for that like reassurance of it's going to be slow and it's going to be heavy I can make these lifts and I can make them well. So there's that like bridging of like confidence, um, the, the, the cognitive component, and then that automatic, uh, just like repetitive drilling, um, that kind of like motor orientation to make it happen. So I think that's entirely, entirely right. It's like having that, that uh, primary bottleneck emphasized and then saying, how's it retained? And how do we have supportive training to keep it retained in later blocks? Um, that's really that, that can be really tough, given how egregious the error is. And given how long someone's trained and how, go- how, how like good they've gotten at weightlifting without making those technical changes. Because suddenly their maximum is really high. Suddenly the expectation is really high. And it's like, oh, we've got to pare down because you can't perform the basic movement with like 60% well. So let's like do 60% the way that's, that's going to get you a huge PR eventually, a, like a huge total eventually. You've got to be able to do it with 60%, 50%, 40%. got to be able to do it with the bar. I know people say like, oh, the bar's not heavy enough to put it in a, it's the right position. It's like, you should be able to move the bar correctly. I, like, I, 
that's not a thing to me. So it's like the bar 40, 50, 60% walking that all the way up to, to maximal weights where suddenly you're looking at like your old, you know, old best. It's like, that looks tight. Like that looks sharp. We can see visible changes and that's, that's a whole process in and of itself. Um, that can be, that can be tough, but I think I would reiterate your point of early on, don't overextend yourself to a bunch of different qualities or different, um, technical issues, uh, because you end up getting what, uh, James Hoffman called in a, in an RP video that I watched a long time ago, the blender effect, where it's like, you have all these ingredients instead of prioritizing some instead of others, you just get everything put into a blender and it's, it's a, it's a, None, nothing of what I want to say is going to sound appetizing. It's a green sludge that kind of resembles calories, but you're almost not sure, not certain. Uh, so I think that's a great point, Chris. Yeah, yeah, those are good. Those are good case examples. You know, ha- having something to anchor with with real life people is really important to try and put it into practice. Yeah, and I think for me, and I don't know how people listening feel about this, but I like to see things done. Um, and that's one thing that's always been hard with me. Like I read a ton of training theory, uh, tried to understand training extensively. And then just like having that confidence of being able to bridge it to practice. I think seeing people work through problems, work through programs, seeing people teach technique or, or demonstrate it. Those, those things have been super helpful, um, which reminds me, if people are interested in getting this kind of demoed and, and um, delivered to them in, in a digestible, understandable way, we do have the Coach Logic mentorship group that Max and I run, and then Chris is um, a recurrent uh, mentor on. He does the, the research debrief every month, and he takes a few scientific articles. He deconstructs them, breaks them down in an understandable way and deliverable way, and then uh, puts out uh, like pretty much a review where you can read it, you can look at it, and understand you know information that helps us guide our training. And then we also talk about it extensively on on one of the the I think it's the the last call of, of every month. Um, so that's the coach logic mentorship group that's linked down below in this episode. It's in every other episode. So check that out. Um, Chris, any last thoughts on, on exercise sequencing and exercise variation? I would say we, we did kind of like common mistakes, how people can improve their practice uh, but what's one big takeaway from you and what's what's something maybe you've been thinking about lately relating to this that you think could help someone better enhance their practice? I think one final thought on this would be that the time for experimentation with new ideas is going to be best served the farthest out from the mean that you yep. can be. So if you have an idea of what may help someone break through a plateau, it's probably best to do that right in the early beginning stages of a plan to test out and see how they respond. It is not the time to do that type of thing before a meet. You want to try and keep everything as consistent and stable as possible uh, at the end. And it's important to also tell the athlete what you're doing and what they should expect from their end. So, hey, we're going to do a block that looks like this. We're going to try these items. How does that sound to you? How do you feel about it? And then we tend to anchor them in the plan. So if you know that at this time of the year, this is going to be the highest volume block, you want to let the athlete know that by this week in the plan, I anticipate you're going to be feeling maybe tired. Mm. You're going to probably be cranky. And if you can emphasize some extra points outside of training to try and help you cope, but also stay in contact with you. And so if the athlete knows it's coming, it's not a surprise. It doesn't make it any better, but if you don't tell the athlete that you designed (laughs) this plan, that's probably going to make them feel really fatigued. And then they get there, they may say, what the hell coach? Like this week is terrible. And then in the back end, you're like, well, yeah, I I planned it that way. Well, why didn't you just tell them up front? So when it comes to varying training or trying some new items, the the farthest out of the plan is where you want to see how they respond 
to that type of variation and new training stimulus. And then as you approach competition, it should look more and more like the normal training that they expect so that it's very consistent and they can anchor their mind to get ready for competition in the most effective way. So I love, I love everything you said. I agree 1000%. And I would say it's kind of funny you mentioned that because I have this text thread with uh, Julie, uh, a powerlift drive coach for, for a long time now. And uh, Monday at 6.01 p.m. after I'd finished writing her program, or just like planning it and kind of getting everything down, I said, sorry, Julie. And she said, what? And I said, back to volume. It's a lot of repetitions, but you're going to do great, sweetie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and that kind of like let off this, you know, thread of, uh, you know, just chatting. But But it's like that idea of like, hey, this is going to be hard. You were just kind of like pseudo peaking competition date changed. We're back to freaking building. We're back to getting better. So it's going to suck a little bit and you know, it's going to be a nice change of pace, but you're going to be tired and that's something to be expected. So I think that is an important conversation to have. And it's important to have your finger on the pulse of how people are perceiving the training. Um, because this, this is a point I picked up. Um, also, was reinforced in a class I just took. It was an intro to sport technology and sport science. And um, Dr. Hornsby was teaching it. And he mentioned that um, people often can have a, you know, entirely different perception of the workout compared to what the coach thought the workout would be or how it would be perceived uh, maybe from a difficulty standpoint. And it's like, is a, is a coach try to find congruence there? Try yeah. to know why something's perceived as hard or difficult. And, if, if that's like a problem or not, because if, if you're like, oh, this person is thinking this training is really, really tough. I don't think it is. It's like, is your compass off or is their compass off? Or are they both in need of calibration um, to find congruence? Because I think the best situation from a coach athlete standpoint is having as much congruence between the plan, the perception of the plan and the experience um, of the plan. That that's like a great place to be and knowing and knowing what each each aspect means, right? Like my experience of it is it's really tough right now. And you're like, oh, that's fine. It's almost like residual for fatigue from last week coming off, or it's just like the process of working through a, a, a deload week, which you typically perceive as this. So it's like almost finding congruence more so in the expectation than perceived difficulty and the actual you know, quote unquote difficulty prescribed by the the coach. Um, so I really like that. I think that's a, that's a really important point. Um, and I, I think the last thing would be, you mentioned, you mentioned having a plan, um, like knowing what you want to do, knowing how to get there and, um, kind of like adhering to that structure. And then what I would say is like create contingency plans off of that. It's like if, if you're going to double down on what's worked and you're going to try new things, as Chris mentioned, you're going to experiment early on and you're going to double down on what's worked later on. If something goes awry, have contingency plans, know how to manipulate training, like effectively understand programming and planning well enough to say, burn the fucking, get out of that boat, fucking burn it, do whatever you got to do to it, get rid of it. We're getting in this one. I don't know. I, I don't know any of the specs. I don't know where it's going. I don't know if any of the equipment works or is operational, but like that one's done. So we have to pivot. It's like know how to pivot. No effective means of pivoting in training, right? Like, okay, if we reduce training, we get this effect. If we increase training, we get this effect. If we alter exercise, we get this effect. What does it do to the peak? What does it do to different uh, different qualities you're trying to develop? So I think those are really important points. And I think that's stuff you kind of gain by coaching and, and just fucking around and fucking up a lot. Um, also, I think it's kind of funny. I said frick like a handful of times on the podcast and just started dropping the F-bomb. So there you go. Um, so so that, that makes a ton of sense. I think this was a great like actionable coaching podcast for people who are interested, Chris. Um if they further want to pick your brain kind of on the, the, the more technical side or the practical application side, you're obviously in the mentorship group. Uh, you're you're um, typically on there as a, 
as a mentor who is talking about research or coming in for for other chats um, about the training process, your research line, all the work you do, if they still can't get enough of the Chris Tabor, where can they find you? Yeah, you got me on Instagram, Dr. Chris Tabor. I'm on uh, Twitter, and then you can just reach me at my school email. I always respond to any emails that come in, and it's taborc at sacredheart.edu, and I'll respond to any questions that you might have. Yeah, that's uh, that's an opportunity I wouldn't pass up personally. If I were listening to this podcast and I had one question, I'd just immediately reach, reach out to Chris. Um, and expect an awesome dialogue. So make sure you do that. If, if you do have questions, you can support the podcast through the Patreon. I don't post there a ton or at all. Um, but it really does help support the show. I mean, that's extra income that can help support the the Spreaker account itself. And then keep me engaged in, in getting people on who are new, having new conversations about different ideas. I mean, Christoph Kip, like, holy cow. He's only been on one other podcast. So I think we really kind of found a hidden gem um and hopefully we can make that a recurring theme um and then we have marco soriano coming on hopefully soon as well obviously chris is on here consistently along alongside max ada um so if you want to continue supporting good conversations about weightlifting and powerlifting performance and sports science more generally go to my patreon you can also use the code to fill wl that's p-h-i-l-w-l at weightliftinghouse.com, in the USA store, at onyxstraps.com, EarthFed Muscle, Virus INTL. Those are all linked down below. Please support the podcast and support me. It helps me keep the show alive. And until next week, this is the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, and we are signing out. <laughs>